प्लीज स्टार्ट नमस्कार माय नेम इज अनिशा शेखर मुखर्जी एंड ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द इंडिया इंटरनेशनल सेंटर दिल्ली आई एक्सटेंड अ वेरी वॉर्म वेलकम टू एवरीवन अटेंडिंग द सेशन especially ratish nanda a speaker for today this is the fourth session in our series of dialogues on architecture as you'd recollect in this series we are trying to discover alternatives to the mainstream method of architecture current today and its attendant shortcomings and problems in the first three sessions we discussed the reasons why we are unable in the main to commission create and inhabit architecture that satisfactorily fulfills the ideal of shelter which is the fundamental objective of building activity and what therefore ought to be the principles and purposes that should direct architectural practice and patronage the two most important such principles that emerged from our discussions were one the importance of extending the idea of the self or the individual to identify with the larger community and the environment the earth and indeed the universe itself and the importance of renewal as the first option in all acts of building rather than the notion of removal and replacement which is current today at a philosophical level ideas of renewal and the awareness of a connection to the entire cosmos are linked to how we view time and space whether we are ourselves we see ourselves as separate and disconnected or whether we regard ourselves as part of a continuum that cannot be divided into strict or exclusive categories in our next few sessions we will listen to stories of architecture that actively incorporate these principles in practice beginning with ratish nanda's talk today entitled conservation for the community architectural conservation whose stated scope is the care of the architecture of earlier times is directly linked to the idea of renewal and is especially relevant to our discussions ironically however much of conventional conservation excludes local communities from both the processes of conservation as well as the spaces that are sought to be conserved we therefore look forward to hearing from ratish how conservation may be done for and with the community to improve their quality of life and social and economic conditions as many of you may know ratish is a conservation architect as ceo aga khan trust for culture aktc in india he heads the multidisciplinary aktc teams presently undertaking two major conservation projects the nizamuddin urban renewal initiative in delhi and the kutub shahi heritage park restoration in hyderabad as part of earlier aktc initiatives ratish has been responsible for the bage babar restoration in kabul in afghanistan and the restoration of the garden of humayun's tomb in delhi he served as an ecomos expert to missions in iran turkey and nepal and lectured extensively in different parts of the world and ratish has major publications to his credit which include among others Delhi the built heritage a listing and rethinking conservation humayun's tomb before i invite ratish to begin his talk i just like to mention that we have one hour for the session and after the presentation we look forward to a discussion where time and internet connectivity permitting we hope to include questions from the audience so please do send in any questions or comments that may come to your mind as the talk progresses may i now request ratish to begin his talk thanks thank you ratish thank you anisha um, thank you for inviting me thank you for to the iic um it's a pleasure to be speaking at the iic again even though without any 
tea and lemon tarts. Um, I'm going to I'm going to hide behind pretty pictures um, and uh, aim to uh, you know. Uh, speak. So my my presentation, um, Anisha, and those of you listening, is um, really uh, divided into three sections. Um, where what I'm I'm trying to broaden the um, you know what the understand our understanding of community is, and to explain um, the the impact um, on the quality of life. Uh, for different communities, starting from the local to the global, um, as a result of our work. So the Aga Khan Trust for Culture is uh, part of the Aga Khan Development Network. Uh, it's a group of agencies set up by His Highness the Aga Khan, all of which aim to improve quality of life. And we at the Trust for Culture do it through uh, cultural projects, whether it's conservation of monuments, museums, um, cuisine, music, um and so on um so uh, you know what we all know is what 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 we've been trying to do and demonstrate to the to the world for the last uh, almost 40 years now that heritage can be leveraged to improve quality of life just just as education or health or uh, urban improvements can be and and we know that you know our heritage in India is really timeless. It's uh, it's diverse and um, and and it's unique. And and every part of India, every region of India, has these are just the world heritage sites. But uh, you know has heritage that can uh, be leveraged in a manner similar to what we've been able to do at at Humayun's tomb and so on. So. Um, uh, these are some of the projects that we've done across the world. Uh, we've got a major music program. We've got museums um, in several countries, and we've we've been doing, in addition to heritage conservation, building city parks. Uh, at least ten of which have now been built and are open to the public across the world. Um, coming back to Delhi, and uh, just just a stone's throw away from the India International Centre is the Humayun's tomb Nizamuddin precinct. Um, this, is a, this is a painting done by architect Himanish Das, uh, which shows how the ensemble of 16th century garden tombs uh, would have looked like till the turn of the 19th century. And um, this is today, um, you know, it's important to do this painting just to say how it was on the banks of the river Yamuna a series of tomb gardens, all in close proximity to the Darga of Hazrat Nizamuddin Aliya. Um, this, I, I, this picture really illustrates a lot of uh, these two pictures. This is our first engagement with, with the site was, as most of you probably already know, in 1997 as a gift of His Highness the Aga Khan on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of India's independence. That is when, um, the Archaeological Survey of India requested us to undertake the garden restoration of Humayun's tomb, which had been inscribed on the World Heritage List in 1993. And one of the conditions was that the gardens need to be restored. So this is a pre-restoration. Pre you look at the, you know, the water, waterfall covered with cement, smaller than what it was, inappropriate uh, vegetation in the form of Ashoka trees, neglect. The, the platform, the octagonal platform on the center right of the image uh, in, in a state of shambles and so on. And this is after image. This is, this is, uh, this is uh, what is, what, what we were able to do from 1997 to 2003. Now, this is very interesting because when you talk about communities, this immediately increased visitor numbers to Humayun's tomb by over a thousand percent. And, um, and through increased ticket revenue and so on, made makes conservation look like a very, very interesting uh, investment. Following this, uh, and you know, we 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 signed up uh, with the Archaeological Survey of India, the Central Public Works Department, and the Municipal Corporation, a larger urban conservation, urban development project that spread over 300 acres in the heart of Delhi, includes three segregated zones of Humayun's tomb, Nizamuddin Bhakti, and the nursery. 
large, large complexes. And uh, mind you, when we started, there were 160,000 visitors coming here. In 2019, just pre-COVID, there were over 2 million. Um, so in the sense, in that sense, the impact has been on a global community of tourists, of uh, you know, visitors coming from across the world and, and indeed across across India. And the reason they all come is this shrine, the shrine of 14th century shrine. And the 14th century shrine has a very dense population, which, which I will come to in the third part of my talk. But uh, this is one of the densest ensemble of, of monuments, of medieval monuments, because everybody wanted to be buried near Hazrat Nizamuddin Aliya's grave. And today, 4 million visitors, pilgrims still come to the shrine. And in this open space, we were able to create a city park um, in an area that was earlier inaccessible to visitors, the Sundar Nursery. This year, we'll probably have 500,000 visitors um, and, and Humayun's tomb. Um, so the next few slides, not really part of this, this talk, but it's very important to also consider that the craftsmen, the community of craftsmen is also important not only the residential community. So what we've been able to do over the last uh, decade and a half, um, we've had about 14 lakh, 1.4 million man days of work have gone into creating or uh, restoring or conserving these monumental uh, buildings, about 60 of them in this complex that we have been able to fix now. And this has required 1.4 million man days of work. Uh, and you know, India is very fortunate that many of these craft skills are still alive, but just so, without good patronage, without including in modern architecture, these craft skills are not going to uh, last very long. And what we realized very early on is that if these monuments are to be conserved, we needed to go back to a, what we call a craft-based approach, not only to remove the cement uh, in this case and uh, uh, you know, reveal these incredible patterns which we were able to then restore and uh, restore. Similarly, the tile work which we found under fragments of, of cement and were able to put it back. And this is pos this has been possible only with, with these, all of these monuments that we've fixed it has really been possible only with this whole group of people. And this is just a random shot taken at any given time of the project where, where 200, 300 craftsmen have been working continuously day in, day out, month after month for over, over a decade. Um, unfortunately, these building craftsmen are nobody's community. They don't fall under the handicraft, handloom sector that the government patronizes. Um, their skills, at least historic skills, are not used in modern architecture because these guys don't understand drawings and architects find it difficult to work with craftsmen without, you know, without making drawings. So this is a community that, that has been significantly impacted by the work and the work approach that we've taken at these monuments. And these have been, we've not, we've not hired any contractors and so on. Instead, we've employed craftsmen. Finally, the second part of my conversation is about open spaces. Now, a lot of people have questioned why is the Aga Khan Trust for Culture making parks? Uh, and, and His Highness has said, His Highness, the Aga Khan has spoken about this often, and there are several, several, several reasons why he's patronized or, or supported park, creation of parks uh, in countries such as uh, Canada, France, uh, Egypt, Afghanistan, uh, Mali and Zanzibar amongst others. And, and it's incredible also at Sundar Nursery to have such a diverse range of visitors coming together. Now, again, through a park, we've been able to impact a community that is uh, city-wide. Uh, city uh, we've, we've been very, very uh, surprised that people have been regularly coming to the parks from, from really all corners of Delhi, but also from further away. Um, so the nursery was uh, was was really earmarked as nursery space in uh, the early part of the 20th century, and um, um, and to plant trees for the British capital of New Delhi, and since then has been um, you know a place where the CPWD has maintained the nursery. And once we opened from the nursery in 2018, 19, it was Delhi's best kept secret. Nobody had any idea that this was here. 
Um, Professor Muhammad Shahir was the landscape architect who, who did an incredible, incredible uh, job in designing uh, the garden um, in these incredible spaces. Um, and this is, a, this is a new garden, but it's inspired by Mughal motifs and, um, and Persian landscape traditions uh, to great effect. But again, where is, so we, we were able to vacate over 20 acres of encroachments and restore uh, world monument status, world heritage status on some of these, these monuments. So the world heritage site in 2016 expanded from 23 acres to um, uh, almost 53 hectares, including many of these monuments. And while the work in terms of environmental, ecological work that we did here is in no way able to affect climate change or any of those big ideas. But the idea over here was that we created a wilderness um, that uh, people come and enjoy, but also that children can come and understand Delhi's geology as it was um, and not what has become of Delhi. So there's the ridge and the rivulets and, and the marshy areas. Now got about a hundred species of birds and butterflies. And this is the community. I mean, Sundar Nursery has been open to, to a large form of uh, different diverse audience from school groups. Um, um, we do all sorts of very, we, you know, it's become a home for a lot of other uh, uh, NGOs, practitioners who, who want to specialize in something, whether it's making sparrow nests or uh, we hope that this will be one of our major objectives is preserving or spreading awareness about the honeybee we do a lot of work around trees, of which we have 300 species at Sundar Nursery. Organic farming, including a weekend market, and this is this is a building that is yet not seen the light of the day. But the idea is also to display tropical and desert flora here eventually one day. Now, coming to the meat of my or the uh, critical uh, 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 portion of my talk is uh, you know often conservationists uh, or people in conservation talk about community involvement in conservation and i've always uh, disagreed with with that quite uh, vehemently uh, because the idea over here or at least in countries such as india is not about uh, burdening poor communities with more responsibilities but instead leveraging um, heritage assets to improve the quality of life of those who live around um, historic areas so we really started in um, in 2007 when we signed the mou on this project um, we really started with a major community engagement including baseline service and some of our findings were was shocking to say the least. You know, this is in the heart of Delhi, and we realized that uh, less than 10% of women had any sort of economic opportunities. We realized that 25% of the population had no in home toilets. We realized that less than 2% of the community had been to a public park in the last one year, less than 2%. We realized that there were uh, almost no vocational training economic opportunities for the youth. Uh, over here, um, and uh, so a lot of these these uh, people on the community flagged um, the lack of cleanliness as one of their prime problems in the neighborhood. So that is what we uh, and of course this is also home for some of the most significant uh, medieval monuments in Delhi. Um, so and uh, you know is very densely populated. So it's the first port of immigration for a Muslim inhabitant coming into Delhi. Um, so this is this is Nizamuddin Basti. Uh, a lot of these uh, are buildings are accommodating several, several, several families. It stands just in the shadow of the World Heritage Site and is also home to, uh, you know, the Kavali music, which was really born here, a Hazrat Amir Kutra in the 14th century, singing to uh, praise to uh, Hazrat Nizamuddin Aliya created Kawali music known now all over the world. We've got Mirza Ghalib. So it's really the cradle of Hindustani uh, culture. 14th century step well. This is when we really got into conservation. This collapsed in 2008. And uh, you notice about 80 people were living right atop the building. We 
uh, over several years and several hundred meetings later, we were able to build alternate houses for all of these people, uh, relocate them, and then clean the well. Um, this was a challenge by the community. They said, if you can clean it, we'll let you fix it. And we removed about 40 feet of sludge to discover this well at the bottom. Um, and then uh, have continued working on this till this date. So this is almost 13 years of work in this one little uh, urban node of, of the Basti. And, um, and, and that work continues. Um, this, you know, mind you, less than 2% of the people had been to any sort of open park. And this was the state of the open spaces around the Basti. So um, this was landscaped and looks easy, but this took us interdisciplinary team about five years to do. We had to connect 200 of these toilets with a sewer line, which we had to lay. Otherwise, they were literally, toilets were not connected to any system. They were just dropping all their human waste onto the Nala. Um, and then a lot of children got involved. We had to put in place a waste managed waste collection system so that these houses had alternates to just throwing their garbage over out of the window. And so that is that is from this to this took took about five years, but but very worth it. Again, there were open parks, but they were overtaken by drug lords and uh, rag pickers. Um, so we had to negotiate all of that, landscape these spaces. Um, we realized there was a local primary school, which was attracting 40 students. We almost redid the building and uh, placed our own teachers here. Mind you, this is all part of a conservation project because if we are to really improve quality of life, conservation and development needed to go hand in hand. And over here, a con equal investment needed to be made in health, education, sanitation, uh, vocational training and, and urban improvements. Um, again, we realized that 25% of the community had no in access to toilets, and yet we were getting 4 million pilgrims. We built um, these toilets long before it was sexy in India to build uh, public toilets. Uh, these are now managed by the community, which is uh, and successfully managed by the community. And also places of worship. Um, Soon after Humayun's tomb was inaugurated in 2013, the community came to us and requested that we conserve this mosque, which is unprotected, but 14th century, and it's been a privilege to uh, to be doing so. Sorry, my slides have got slightly garbled. We've set up a community. Uh, every kid in the Basti now goes through at least two hours of art and education and computer education. We realized that women were dying in childbirth, and we set up a polyclinic uh, which, uh, mind you, the local population is only 20,000, and yet over 500,000 individuals have accessed this polyclinic. So uh, people from across Delhi are accessing the doctors that we have placed here, the doctors the municipality has placed here, and getting about 30 different tests done. So what impact that has on the economy uh, needs to be uh, you know, determined. Now, what, one of the things we learned quite early on is that, uh, uh, you know, local communities, the youth's aspiration does not really allow them to become masons or stone carvers. These are hard work, but uh, the youth of the local community took very well to uh, this new craft of tile making that we needed to revive with the support of master craftsmen from Uzbekistan. So these are tiles that are used in the in the conservation work. Uh, similarly, we realized that the women had next to no employment, but but practiced crafts such as crochet and uh, paper cutting, of which we made a business. Uh, these women had a turnover of some 40 lakh of rupees last year. These are women who've never earned a penny in their lives. So a lot of what we've done is women's park, women's economic opportunity, women's toilets, um, uh, self-help groups, and so on. So the change has really been driven by uh, the women of the community. This is another group I'm very proud of, uh, not only because they make the best kebabs in town and the best Nihari in town, but also because these are a group of women who were either unemployed or domestic workers, and we've set up a kitchen for them. And uh, in the last few years, they've been invited by five-star hotels across India to, to manage their kitchens, um, having never stepped out of the community before then. We've also had uh, local youth become heritage guides, heritage interpreters. Um, 
they do walks quite often encourage everybody to come and you know get them to walk them walk you through nizamuddin basti and sundar nursery and covid uh, we all we've all heard how uh, the tablighi jamaat was uh, you know the epicenter of the covid pandemic in 2020 we had uh, fortunately so we've got a whole team of health workers about 50 of them uh, we've had for many years the group is now being disbanded uh, as the project comes to an end but uh, these women played an absolutely critical part role to make sure that covid did not spread in nizamuddin basti in fact in shocking as it may sound not one case of covid happened in the basti uh, even after uh, there was this uh, hundreds of cases at the at the tabligi jamaat headquarters which is also located in the basti so they did stellar work which was which was you know very well and these are early days when nobody knew for sure how it was spreading what precautions needed to be taken and so on so very meaningful work uh, that these women are able to do finally just before i finish just two or three slides of our other project in in hyderabad and uh, you know similar large urban conservation project we're doing it's an incredible site the kutub shahi heritage park there are about 80 monuments uh, within one uh, one ensemble it's, it's it's quite incredible and uh, even though this is a very regular conservation urban um, you know landscape project even here there are places of worship so we were able to restore the idga and uh, put it back into use this was war ruin so about 70 to 80 thousand people turn up at eid prayers every 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 eid uh, but also water. When we started to uh, to do to undertake this project in 2013, we were really buying water for conservation work. We had to buy tankers of water to undertake the conservation work. And um, these step wells were were in a ruinous condition. And just just this one Bari Bauli took us three years to fix. And over 700, 600, 700 cubic meters of stone masonry had to be undertaken. But just this bauli itself now uh, accumulates over 3 million liters of water every monsoon. And there are about seven more of, of these. So again, you know, uh, through the conservation effort, one is sort of able to fulfill a lot of, uh, a lot of objectives, uh, both of the government and development objectives. Um, again, you know, um, his Highness sort of has sort of put it into this week, um, demonstrating what really is the potential, how such projects um, that we undertake can be, uh, can have a positive impact well beyond conservation, uh, creating economic opportunities, the growth of civil society, and so on. Um, again, these these projects take take a lot of effort, a lot of money. And uh, in Delhi, it has been critical to have this original MOU with the five parties on the left of the screen. But also over the last 15 years, we've been able to raise, uh, get interest and raise uh, funds from several corporates, several uh, you know, government agencies, international and national foundations um, to be able to do this work, even though His Highness the Aga Khan remains the principal patron of, of these projects. And finally, um, it requires an interdisciplinary team. Uh, we've got about 30 different disciplines represented on the project team. And, um, and for me, that is one of the biggest joys of, of, of being part of this is to, to work alongside people I would otherwise um, not have a chance to do so. I think that is my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ratish. That was, um, it was quite incredible the scope of work that uh, you and your team have managed to achieve. And um, what I find particularly, uh, well, inspiring is um, one, the fact that uh, 
first of all, most people don't talk about the community. You said, you know, people talk about the community, but uh, very often what the community is, is, is something that's that's up in the air. So I think the first thing you've demonstrated is that you must know what is the community that you are trying to address, which starts from the local perhaps, but doesn't end there. But the other thing is that most conservation uh, tends to essentially, in a sense, look at a global community in, in the sense it tends to look at conservation for tourism when, when it does look at, uh, you know, conservation in that sense. And local communities are very often not considered as part of your, uh, even the brief. Now, you, because of your particular, let's say, temperament and talents, and especially also because of your organization's objectives, uh, have managed to marry the requirements of the local community with uh, that those of the city, with those of you know uh, people coming in from other parts of the country, other countries as well. But this is not what one is taught as architectural conservation, isn't that so? So uh, this is something that you know you you've sort of built up and developed with time. So therefore, do you think that the way we teach conservation? has to change in the sense that the community has to occupy center stage again, because it was a community which I presume was involved in the creation of these, you know, these, these structures in the first instance, both through, um, uh, you know, giving, uh, whether, whether it's the space or the funds or through the crafts. And the craft sector is another community that you spoke about. So, so what do you think we need to do in terms of the way we teach uh, conservation today? I think we need to um, we need to take conservation studies outside of architecture colleges. Okay. I mean, uh, it's unfortunate. Where do we take them to? Sorry. I said, where where do we take them to? Any university. I mean, I think uh, conservation, as I said, is an interdisciplinary thing. It does not need only architects. Um, yes. And it's unfortunate that uh, conservation in India is conservation in India is taught at architecture schools. And is not open to non architects. There's a bird trapped in my office. Um, <laughs> um, so, so I think, I think architects, I mean, our conservationists need to work alongside a lot of other disciplines and to understand the potential of the historic urban space to be able to benefit. And, and to, I mean, I think the critical thing is to demonstrate that conservation and development are not enemies and the, like a horse and carriage go hand in hand. And uh, um, I mean, you know, I studied at the School of Habitat Studies and uh, Professor A.G.K. Menon was the dean then. And, and you know, one of the earliest thinkers of conservation in India, and a lot of his early thinking is about how in India conservation uh, needs to, uh, you know, go beyond imagining what our past was, but benefiting the present. And I think that that is critical for architectural for conservation. It's very critical that urban planners, architects, um, development specialists, especially you know, for example, the Tata Institute of Social Sciences, or even the um, you know any of these uh, social science institutes, um, or people from that background come and teach conservation, mm -hmm. or teach at conservation courses. Yeah, so well, what you said is 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 very pertinent, Ratish, in the sense that conservation cannot just be confined either to architecture or to architects, and you need to uh, have other people as well. But my question is that you've talked about planners and you've talked about other development professionals, but uh, again, uh, most planning policies and a lot of, let's say, conventional development, again, does not consider the community, does it? So what you're saying is that you increase the scope of the professionals who are working on conservation, but that still doesn't take care of uh, recognizing that uh, communities need to be part of the conservation process, does it? You know, Anisha, the critical thing is conservationists are repeatedly told, or conservation students or conservation practitioners are repeatedly told that mm -hmm. get the community to fix. It's their heritage. They should take care of it. The community mm -hmm. doesn't have means to you know, two full meals a day. Um, they will be damned if they're going to take care of additional responsibilities. I remember a very vivid in incident. I was walking around Chirag, Delhi while I was in college and saw this guy knocking down a historic building. Mm -hmm. And once you screamed at this guy, this guy he said, you know, but I have no money, no, no food to eat. Um, 
so i'm breaking down this monument and i will set up a shop so it's 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 that sort of thing i think what we professionals need to realize that our commitment is not to bricks and mortar but mm -hmm. our commitment is to everything that is associated with that heritage it could be um, intangible heritage associated with music and food it could be uh, the community that lives around it and how that could benefit from that mesh and that has been our guiding principle from the beginning i mean you know daga khan's been talking about this since the 1970s early 1980s and unesco accepted the uh, historic urban landscape resolution about uh, 2015 and that is very much what we've been trying to do over here is to look at a whole large urban area which includes creating gardens planting trees fixing monuments building roads uh, laying sewer lines uh, improving education health sanitation infrastructure and to the extent possible and that has required great partnership with several government agencies and uh, um, and and here we are with a model and which we hope that uh, you know practitioners academics institutions will will use this and uh, and judge for themselves how this can be adapted to other sites in the country yes in fact uh, what you're essentially saying is it's, it's a people first sort of uh, you know uh, objective or philosophy that has activated all of you and um, I, I see what you mean especially when you go to Sundar nursery and you see you see all sorts of people you know the entire city so it's a space where people can come together should they wish to and which is I think a wonderful thing but um, and yes I do hope that you know the demonstration of what is possible uh, using conservation as let's say a springboard uh, will will hopefully you know activate other people to do so but there's another thing that uh, you know the reason not the reason but one of the facilitators for for this um, for the way you could handle this is also uh, that essentially you have a lot of skills within your organization right so you have the wherewithal in a sense now if um, if if this model is to be replicated let's say which is what we'd all like to see for instance, um, you know, there was this uh, thing we started called the Friends of ASI, which was a purely voluntary sort of organization. And we uh, went to the, uh, you know, the Vijay Mandal and the Begumpur uh, mosque area. And essentially, we were trying to set up a dialogue with the people who stayed there and, and the ASI, who were the custodians of the site. And it's as you say, you know, if people need a loo, uh, you know, and they do, don't have a space, they'll use whatever open space. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's silly to tell them that, no, no, that this is, you know, sacrosanct and you can't come here. And if they want to build an extra room because the family is expanded, but they come within the ambit of, you know, the so many meters from the historic building, and therefore you can't do it. It's uh, it's self-defeating exercise because you're not going to get people's cooperation. But what I'm trying to say is that essentially the conventional model is one of enclosures and it's a lot of mistrust, right? Uh, so hopefully what you've demonstrated uh, is, is that you can buy dialogue uh, and sustained work remove that mistrust but um, again as i said uh, you know for this to become mainstream because what one would like to see is a kind of wonderful work you've done here uh, is replicated not replicated but inspires other sites because every site will be different and um, but it's been a tough job as you said it's taken you a long time and um, do you see that therefore happening or do you think that the way we teach, um, you know, again, I'm not addressing other disciplines because they're not my expertise, but the way we teach architecture itself has to change and conservation in its meaning of, um, you know, the, the care of resources for future generations has to come into the picture first so that we are frugal about what the materials we use. Uh, we are mindful of the conservation of, of the of people's skills and we include them in mainstream architecture. In fact, that's a question somebody's asked that how can we get the craftspeople back into mainstream architecture? So do you think the, the very way we teach architecture needs to change and does conservation as a philosophy, as well as, you know, the methods of conservation, let's say, do they, do, does, should it be coming in? Is, is that what you'd say? Absolutely. I mean, just, just look at what you've been saying. I mean, one of the things about this X meters around a monument, now, obviously, somebody really hair-brained came up with that scheme. Um, 
instead of sort of saying 100 meters around the monument is prohibited, I would turn that around on its head and say 100 meters is where the government is committed to investing in housing improvement, street improvement, urban landscape, urban services, based management, and all of that to demonstrate that that 100 meter zone becomes something of a privilege rather mm -hmm. than a punishment. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, the master plan should allow for it, the government should be committed to doing so, and so on. And then, you know, um, it is difficult. What we've been do doing is difficult, and and uh, but we've also had a lot of support from across the um, spectrum. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it can be done again. It, it needn't be such a large uh, mega urban conservation project. But on a smaller scale, almost every monument could benefit from academic institutes, uh, which are interdisciplinary, um, uh, resident welfare associations, which are, uh, you know, have mandates. So, so the Aga Khan Trust for Culture could be replaced by several different types of institutions uh, mm -hmm. to undertake projects such as this. I mean, in the end, what have we done? We've, we've uh, been persistent. We've stayed on our site for 15 plus years. Uh, we've brought in together an interdisciplinary team. We've signed off a single MOU with multiple government agencies with different mandates. We've served as a bridge between um, various sort of funding agencies. Uh, uh, we've, we've, we've sort of talked about, talked in depth. We've had one of the critical things, Anisha, is in the Nizamuddin area, we would on an average would have had at least uh, 200 meetings a year which over with with members of the community uh, which over um, 15 years adds up to thousands of meetings and we know everybody by we know every family we know the needs of every family we over the last 15 years understood how these families have progressed um, so, so that that relationship can only cannot come either in the corporate world or in the government sector. It cannot be something that ESI does. And um, so, so yes, I, I think I think the fact is, and we're trying to share our learnings from across the world with educational institutions. But what is absolutely critical is that the profession, or as architects and urban planners, we are committed to the city. I mean, the whole Lal Dora area. I mean, we still today don't know what the legal status of Nizamuddin is, whether it's a slum, whether it's a special development area, whether it's an urban village, we don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Even after all these years, we don't know. So we've done RTIs, we've done all sorts of things, tell us this area. So I think I think we've been, as, as professionals, we've been uh, a bit, uh, you know, we've shied away from our responsibility by saying Lal Dora hai, and anything goes. And you've seen the results of it across Delhi. So that has to stop. I think a lot of conservation as professionals, we need to show a lot more initiative and find solutions which exist. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's, it's initiative, but the other thing that you demonstrated is it's a willingness to dialogue, uh, you know, willingness to talk. No, but to you know, I mean, that is not only willingness. I think that that is the basis of everything. Uh, it was we before we signed off with the government of India. After the government of India had invited us, we required two years of dialogue uh, before we signed off a piece of paper to get the CPWD, the ASI, and the municipal corporation sign a single piece of paper. Was a nightmare because you know they have different mandates and we had to balance each other and 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 deep suspicion of each other. Yes. Um, and um, so uh, to the extent in Sundar Nursery between two national monuments, the CPWD had built several buildings so that the ASI does not claim more land. Um, so we have to be a bridge between those agencies also. But I think it's, it's a professional obligation, opportunity to, um, to improve the, the city and spaces in the city. And, um, and that's what, uh, you know, His Highness the Aga Khan has been trying to do across the world. But I want to ask you, Ratish. So you said that this is something that you know you could have done, but for instance, the ASI could not have done it. So my question is that um, why not? I mean, you need civil society. You need civil society. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, I think the role of civil society. I don't see any government officer. Government officers are extremely burdened with their day-to-day responsibilities. Um, mm-hmm. I think this this requires a NGO mentality of uh, sort of benefiting people, especially people in need. Uh, I think civil society engagement with uh, professionals is absolutely with with agencies, government agencies is absolutely critical. It's not easy. Um, it takes a lot of time. It's not possible. I mean, um, um, you know, for example, Anisha, just just going back to Jantar Mantar and your own involvement there. I mean, the the thing is, it's not possible for park hotels to have that engagement. So that corporate is not going to have that engagement. You need, I mean, for us, it's our mandate. This is what we do. This is what we are born with. This is what our job is. Um, and that, I mean, it's it's backbreaking because uh, you need, you need, and you don't need a liaison officer. There have been plenty of good projects that have been derailed because they've engaged a liaison officer to deal with the government. But I think it's 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 us professionals who need to engage with our counterparts in the municipality, in the CPWD, in the ASI, in the DDA, and so on. And and that dialogue has been very very meaningful to us. And a lot has come out of as a result of it. Yes. But, I mean, if I start counting as an average, I think we we would have had, you know, at least two and a half three thousand meetings with the community, and we would have had. Uh, at least a hundred bilateral meetings with each of the three or four government agencies every year. Um, so yes. you know, just add that up. Yes, but what you said was very telling, Ratish, because you said you need an NGO mentality, and you need somebody who has the good of the people in mind. And one would one would sort of presume that is the role of all government agencies. So it's a sad state when when it comes to that. And yes, again, that you mentioned the Jantar Mantar, and it's. Very interesting that you did so because again we stayed on for about fifteen years with with the Jantar, mm-hmm. and we had no liaison officer. So you know, I I also met a great number of people, had a number of meetings. But uh, again, yes, the reason that uh, you know we couldn't stay on is because, uh, for instance, uh, your organization is in a sense it encapsulates the work of many, many organizations, right? Many government organizations through professionals, through mandates, through whatever. However, if we are to make, and here we're talking about conservation as a tool where people engage in, where you're again talking about the community. And when you talk about the community, you also mean people around, whether they are, you know, business people or just residents, or they may not be, um, they may be just interested in it, right? So how do you engage with them? And I think that is what I'm trying to get at, that conservation ideally should be able to facilitate efforts from all sorts of people, not just uh, you know, organizations like your, which, which are very committed and which have the staying power and the mandate, but a whole lot of other people, because that's the only way you said, you know, and we have, we, we are unique in the sense that, you know, the kind of uh, spaces, architectural and otherwise that we have. Uh, so if if we are to actually get everybody in into this process, and I think conservation as a philosophy in terms of using whatever you have rather than relegating it to you know the dustbin is is what should activate everything architecture yeah. otherwise so i think what you've said you know actually brings up the issues that we face as a society at large where you need you know <laughs> people like you who can you know carry on for a lot of time oh, you know very interesting story anisha mm-hmm. uh, we we signed this mou in um, in um, 2007 and because we are an international organization and so on, we could not really start talking to the every member of the community before we signed off on it. We had spoken to the elected leadership uh, and so on, but but once we signed the MOU, it was all over there. And we spent a year building bridges with the community because it came with a lot of suspicion. Uh, just before us, there was a deputy commissioner called Mr. Vijay Singh in the Municipal Corporation of Delhi, um, who um, was really modeling himself on the lines of Mr. Jagmohan. And he'd gone around the community sort of saying, Jaha park hai, waha mein makan banaunga, aur jaha makan hai, waha mein park banaunga. So he'd got this whole you know, mentality of uh, mm. 
that you know the monument should be sitting or the darga and all these monuments should be sitting in green spaces and on the edge of the community where we landscape these parks he will make multi storied 20 storied buildings where mm. all the community will be put into these pigeon holes mm. and he thought we were going to come and pay for these 20 storied buildings um, so that's what he sort of told the community so we started with that backlash where the first day the community signed there were public meetings about how we should be you know stoned to death and so on and one of the interesting things for us is we realized very early on and i mentioned this in passing that we cannot really get in there and start doing historic building so we really started by building the school we started by setting up a polyclinic we started with that sort of thing and everybody wants their kids to go to school and within the first year there were 450 local children going to this primary school Mm-hmm. And that's when we were able to really start a meaningful dialogue and explain how we're not there to make parks where people live and buildings <laughs> where there are parks. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think uh, it was very important for us on hindsight to not start with conservation, but to start with things that the community needs. Basically demonstrate, build up trust through something that the community wants, yes. And essentially, it also means that um, you know everybody, all of us, whether we are professionals or members of civil society or we're working in the government, we need to get out of this colonial mentality where we think we are trying to do good by you know moving people out and putting them in these multi-story buildings, which uh, you know seem to us the epitome of progress, but which is actually pretty awful not just to live in, but you know so difficult to maintain and all the rest of it. Uh, for instance, there's a there's a film called. Uh, vertical city i think uh by which is on um you know which is on these people in bombay who were relocated to a multi-story building which requires lots and lots of inputs you know for the lift for water and there are people there who have not come down for years there are old people because the lifts don't work and there are people who come down seven stories ten stories every day to lift up water little children so it's you know it's it's so awful but it's it's sort of seen as the model of progress, which is very unfortunate. And I think we need to get out of that, um, you know, that mode and also this colonial mode of making things look pretty and sit in a park by themselves. And uh, so, so what you what you've demonstrated is that it can be done on the scale that you've done. So I'm sure uh, that will, you know, enthuse and inspire people to do what they can at whatever level. The other question I have is related to a very important point you made about the craftspeople and how they are essential for any sort of conservation. And um, uh, if if they don't exist, then, you know, all these monuments that we sort of put on our stamp papers and, you know, we we put on our stamps won't won't exist uh, for very long. Uh, But that's something that's not uh, that's not really, even if it's realized, uh, you know, sort of perceptually, nothing happens in, in fact. So um, two questions. One is that the number of people that you are, uh, you know, employing uh, in, in the sites. So is, is that continuing? Is that going to go on for a long time? And uh, is there anything that uh, you think uh, you can do with the kind of visibility that you have uh, to make sure or to at least demonstrate that these crafts can be used in contemporary buildings as well? Yeah, um, no, I mean, every every good thing has to come to an end. Uh, we've got a few, few more months left of our projects, both in Delhi and Hyderabad. Um, a lot of these craftsmen have been with us uh, from the beginning, but a lot of them, um, you know, one of the big worries is that they're not teaching the next generation is not involved at all. Mm-hmm. So what we've done is every summer we've called their next generation and given them 5,000 rupees a month to just learn the craft. Um, they come for the money, they come to stay in Delhi, but uh, at least they get a handle off on it. Um, the Delhi Urban Art Commission, this is 10 years ago, did sort of pass a new thing that the 2% of money that is to be spent on artwork in a public building can go towards building craft. But I think that's buried somewhere. I don't think even the profession is aware of that. Uh, that was uh, that was the only attempt that I've made to make it mainstream. Um, but what we're also trying to do now is uh, make a few films and brochures to explain to architects and engineers how craftsmen can be employed and and used so so that is in the pipeline that is wonderful and if you share that with architecture colleges as well i think yeah. it will help a lot because uh, you know even the two percent that you spoke about in terms of the art component that's also fairly superficial because what we are trying to actually look at is how can the crafts be included in the very process of construction not just in 
called beautification. And for instance, um, I think the CPWD specifications uh, don't they have they don't have lime uh, punning and lime plaster as an item anymore. I mean, it, it's not there, you know, which is um, which is basically says that you can't do that. Therefore, in, in buildings that you make today. So I think it has to again reflect in the processes of construction as well. So we are we're also engaging with the CPWD. We've had three meetings this week um, hmm. to expand their specifications. That's great. That's wonderful to know because, uh, you know, then at least uh, there is that window of opportunity for people who do want to utilize those. those no, I mean, that is clearly a, a big advantage that will come out of that. So we are trying to share all the specifications that we built up over the years and mm -hmm. have CPWD accept them as part of their own thing. So let's see where that goes. Okay, and one more question I have is that the crafts people you're saying that very soon the project will end and obviously you can't, you know, they won't be there anymore. But is there something like crafts directory that you can put up in the public domain, which again will allow therefore maybe interested people who don't know how to get around to actually accessing craft skills to to be able to do. It? Well, yes and no, Anisha, it's, it's very, uh, very difficult. Um, you know, one thing is that. Uh, these craftsmen are valued and we've often had one of the theft we've had at sites is our craftspeople. And I'm not joking. We've had we've had architects come in and take our craftspeople at the middle of the night in a bus load, offering them like 50 rupees per day extra. So, so we think there is a future for that. Um, and the flip side is that over the years, thousands of craftsmen have worked with us. And uh, and and there is several, I mean, several lakhs, if not crores, of their money in provident fund that is still stuck. And we have no way to access them because they change their phones, they do all of that. We've, we've been trying to locate these people whose money is lying in provident fund and get it to them. But, you know, they just change their numbers and they move on because they work 100 days a year. And mm. um, it's been quite a challenge. So, you know, the directory, I know a lot of people trying to do a directory. I mean, I think basically what happens is word spreads within the community of where craftsmen are needed and then they flock to you. Mm -hmm. So they'll they'll come to us if, if we need them. That's yeah. It. yeah, well, you know, I uh, uh, long ago, about seven, eight years ago, I had called um, somebody who's taught you also, Badri. Badri Narayan, to a jury on uh, for my research uh, paper students in the ID department. And they had craft as their theme. And he asked a very pertinent question. He said, what's more important, that the craft survives or the craftsperson survives? Okay. And that's a question really, isn't it? Because if the craftsperson has to survive and he finds that the craft doesn't do that for him, then you know he or she will pull a rickshaw big yeah. stone. But uh, if if they find an opportunity, then I, I'm sure that you know the craftsperson and the craft will survive. So um, so thank you, Ratish, for demonstrating to us what is possible when you actually consider uh you know the community and people and uh you know don't limit yourself just to some very narrow definitions of what one needs to do and thank you for also demonstrating to us the perseverance that is required and i hope it will be um you know it'll be an inspiration for many people and i request you to share as much as you can in the public domain about what you've done because as i said you know it is something that does uh make everybody very hopeful the fact that you know so much can be done uh, is is wonderful. It gives us hope, and I am sure everybody who's uh, heard you today will take that back with them, and uh, hopefully will be able to you know do something in their own whatever their domain is and whatever their profession is. So thank you very much for taking out the time and for uh, showing us what what uh, has been possible and what all you've done. And um, I'd like to thank the ISC also for. Um, giving us the opportunity to have Ratish on and everybody who's attended the session. And we'll be continuing with stories of architecture about you know, people who have managed to put into practice what a lot of us talk about uh, sort of in theory. So thanks, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Anisha. Thank you. Thank you.